Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to this fourth session of IBIU for the BIM course. Today's topic is BIM for Engineers. As a reminder to all that this course is offered through IBI Group's um, certified AIA continuing education program and as such would qualify for one hour of structured continuing education learning either through the AIA or through your local uh, professional associations. Now, in order to qualify, you need to report your hours independently to your associations, or if you're a member of the AIA, please enter your AIA number at any point through the webinar in the questions, because then when we do a, a, a list of attendees, we'll see the name and the AIA number. So just type in a question, but type in your AIA number. Standard copyright. So today's course is going to focus how BIM can be harnessed specifically for engineers. It will touch upon fundamental BIM uses, how it's meant to bring efficiency, value, etc. And we're looking at how to achieve a single source of truth for projects and assets that are handled within a BIM process. We want to understand how BIM can be harnessed, how to take advantage and apply a BIM execution plan in order to um, develop architectural and engineering information, understand where BIM can bring unique benefits, and imagine the potential of BIM scope. Now, to understand clearly here, I want to be very explicit. You know, the reason we're having this, this particular session is to squash the fact or the thought that people believe BIM is just for architects. And that's, I would say, farthest from the two, truth. Architects were probably the earliest adopters of BIM when BIM was first coined. But BIM is by, by any means not just for architects. It is a process that's applied to the entire life cycle of a project of which, which the engineers play a large and very important role. So a quick BIM recap. Um, the word BIM is both a noun as well as a verb. So as a verb, it's the process of involving in the generation and management of digital representations of physical and functional characteristics of spaces and places. Now that's an interesting approach to what BIM means. I, I equate it differently as well. I'll say BIM is just a collection, of, a digital collection of assets, whether it's within a design modeling tool, an asset management system, or anything in between. It's something about the components you see when you look around the rooms you're in today. That's what BIM is. As a noun, it's the files. It could be models, uh, CAD files. It doesn't matter. But it's the collection of information exchanged throughout a network to support decision-making processes about, again, a place, an asset, a collection of information. Take note of that last one, BIM can be applied in a scaled manner across any type of project, whether it's a building, linear infrastructure, or a system. So that equates to the I, the B, the, and the I of IBI. So we can apply the BIM process to any type of project scaled from large to small, spanning across the globe. Collaboration and planning are two very critical and important aspects of BIM. There will be a whole session on collaboration in the coming months. And planning is what this is all about, understanding how architects use BIM, how engineers use BIM, and in the coming two session, section, sessions, um, how specs can relate to BIM and how contractors could use BIM. So there's very varying facets of what it means to apply BIM on a project. In its essence, BIM is geometry plus data. Data can be scaled. So it can be as extensive as something you're seeing on my screen there, or it can be as simple as I placed a component in, a, in an application and I need to know if it's a wall versus a floor versus a pipe versus a column versus a beam. Those are fundamentals. And with most of our BIM tools that are in, a, in the industry today, it's far more difficult to have unintelligent components than it is to have intelligence. What I mean by that is in the bottom left there, if I model that wall, by nature the application will know it's a wall. For me to tell it that it's not a wall, that's far, far more of an effort than to just 
know that it's going to be a wall to begin with. On the um, linear infrastructure, the civil geospatial aspect, BIM applies to the continuity and the connectivity of, of information from macro to micro and vice versa. So I like this slide here because it's using um, the element being a curb guardrail, guardrail. It's part of a bridge, which is part of an, a road, which is part of a complex infrastructure of road networking. So that macro to micro, that micro, that interrelationship of information that would apply to the life cycle of that specific component is fluid and dynamic and will change and is all connected. Um, BIM can also be used as part of an overall life cycle data management system or information management system. This example here is just a simple depiction showing the fact that in one, in any model, so that's your virtual representation, you could have an equip piece of equipment or an asset with an ID, and that ID perpetuates to other streams of data, whether it's an intelligence schematic, a spec, a maintenance manual, an operations screen. And they're all interrelated. They may be connected. You may be able to go from one to the other, hyperlink, etc. Yet that relationship holds true. And the critical thing is to avoid data duplication. That's something we strive in the BIM process. We want to make sure that, that you're not repeating efforts from design into construction, into operation, or spanning across design in various facets of the project. We talk about BIM uses. So if we're going to do BIM, why are we going to do it? And the first two sessions, the second one specifically, focused on each one of these BIM uses across the wheel. The gist is, you set project BIM goals stating we're going to model and this is why. And the orange ones are your base ones. If there's a model, you're going to use it to make your drawings and schedules. That's the fundamental contractual obligation that's going to be here for a long time still. If we're modeling and circumventing our ability to make our drawings, then it really defeats the purpose. So the model would enhance that. And then because there's a model, you can visualize and you can review. The fundamental. The Typical, the, the black one, the, the grayish boxes, those are what are in the industry. So you'll go to conferences and, oh, you want to do BIM to class you tech. Yep. You plan it. You understand what you're clashing and why you're doing it, what you're going to analyze. We'll talk a little bit today about analysis and some of the benefits that can bring to engineering. Um, and then the other BIM uses are ones you may or may not see on a project in any near future, but operations asset management, you'll hear me keep talking about assets because it's all about assets at the end of the day. Everything we're designing is, even if we're not going to be part of any life cycle management, all of our components are assets to the owner that are going to be managed and something's going to occur to them throughout a 30 or 50 year lifespan long after we're done doing our design. And the critical thing to note is just as we are familiar with BIM in the industry, BIM is the buzz and everyone has to do it and the contractors are calling it VDC and everybody wants to share a model and we have our Revit and, it's, and our civil 3D and all that good stuff. Owners are coming at it thinking, oh, that's irrelevant. I have a bunch of assets. I want to digitize it, I want to know things about it, and then I want to force any consultants and contractors to give me more information about it. So owners are seeing BIM from that end point and then infusing that at the start point of where we're doing our projects. We also talked about level of detail, LOD. Very important thing for everybody on this call, LOD has crept its way into our contracts. So what I like to stress and make sure that we're important is, if we have contracts or arrangements in DB projects or P3s where they say, as design, you're going to do an LOD 300, nod your head, sounds good. Not, not a lot of risk because we're going to model and we've got to model to make our drawings and in order to get good drawings, we need to do about that 300 level. That's enough detail there for us to represent what we need in our drawings. But of course, um, we get pushed to do more for the same fee. That's just the nature of things. So anything higher, it gets a little more riskier because that means we're going to try, we're being pushed to take responsibility for things like steel connection details, which would normally be done by a fabricator. So keep that in mind, that, that LOD 300 is 
about the right fit, hire, raise the question, engage the design technology team, let's figure out why we're being asked. And then these levels of definition in the UK, I like showing this because it shows the stages of a project. On the top there, stage number one to seven, that's their Royal Institute of British Architects uh, REBA phase. And it equates to AIA's uh, schematic design development, et cetera, or simply 30, 60, 90. It all maps. The point is, know where you are in the project, because I've seen oftentimes during briefs and concepts we're doing some incredible detailed work that just positions ourselves for rework and redoing. So keep in mind where you are on the project with respect to how much BIM we do and why we're doing it. So to start this, I'll ask, so what's your flavor of BIM? And that's an important question based on what I just said. There's multiple BIM uses, there's multiple ways of doing things. So let's say we're in the building world and building engineering would have your electrical, your mechanical, I'll just wait for the screen to update, your structural, and they would coincide alongside architectural. So this is where in buildings, so, so BIM has traditionally been thought of, well, it's a buildings thing, and then it's an architect's thing. But even in the world of buildings, it's not just the architect's thing. So you can cut your model after you've combined it all together. We can get a list of components. So volumes of concrete, weights of steel, number of beams and versus type, columns, etc. How many light fixtures? How many air handling units? How many space heaters? Um, length length of pipes running underneath um, underneath the uh, the buildings. How that's all connecting? All of that can come into play. Uh, we can find clashes, uh, engineering systems, mechanical against structural, mechanical against electrical, engineering against architectural, all of those can come together. I always stress BIM won't answer the question of what do I do. So this will, BIM won't tell you lower the, reroute the duct, raise the structure, um, cut the beam in half, raise the whole building. Decisions still have to be made, and some of those examples I just used are obviously obscure, and you know you wouldn't cut the beam in half. But if the design isn't occurring around a response to what you're seeing in these clashes, something catastrophic could occur. And then from the model, you can generate drawings and schedules and schematics and isometrics, and you take it on to further advanced visualization. There's so much, uh, so many other things that can be done. On the civil side, it's still been, and this is where when I travel around, I remind it's information modeling. From that model, you still get drawings just like you would in a building, but you can now develop plans and profiles based on an alignment which has 3D information built into it, allowing you to portray how, in this case, the road, but it could be road alignment, track alignment, piping alignment, hydraulic networks, how that would all flow around, along the alignment. There could still be 3D virtual coordination for space or reserved space. This is a port project. Um, you can still have, there would be underground utilities. Probably the, one, of my, in my, one of my favorite applications on how does everything interact underneath that surface, not only with what's being proposed, but what's actually there. And how does that interact with the building that sits on top of it? And is that connecting outward to the infrastructure that it's connecting, that it's supposed to connect to? You can have existing infrastructure with new infrastructure layered into it with combination of surface utilities or surface layers or multiple layers of what makes up the surface as well. And all of those come together to form the civil infrastructure that encompasses the environment, really. Um, where we do transportation work, roadway intersections take up some of the greatest space that I see from a site perspective, and then often we, we ask, well, what do you, what's in those interstitial spaces? How are they designed? What do they look like? How does that visualize with, uh, with the environment and the, the stakeholders that interact? You can have roundabout designs, rail networks, plugging into the stations and the buildings based upon the alignments that are set. 
And then we can, in the built, built world, we can do laser scanning of existing sites and features and integrate that into our designs. And these laser scans are becoming more and more powerful as the years come along. Um, the level of, of detail that can be picked up to, the, to, under, to, to achieve an understanding of the components and assign components to intelligent metadata that allow us to then mod, use them in models and designs or model around them as a base. Some very powerful tools we have there. Uh, we can have multidiscipline projects. This is our James Street GO station. And you see the building in the background, but you know the, the interaction of the, the physical, the built environment, the, the movement of the people, the hardscaping versus the softscaping, and you can see the train in the distance in the, uh, the mid-right there. So there's that interaction with the rail alignment and the overall network and how that continues. So very powerful project with multiple, multiple disciplines at play here. This is the LaSalle Bridge in Calgary. I like this example because it's an example of a very heavy um, level of detail where there's, you know, I would say there's, there's modeling to that finite scale. It's possible, and what I would offer to projects is, you know, we've got to know why we would model to this depth, to what value. Is it a client need? Is it a contractor need? Is there a purpose to it? Because you could imagine the time taken to develop something of this nature, and we've got to make sure that we plan our projects accordingly to allow for something like this. But you could see how beautiful the technology is to allow us to achieve something of this level of detail. Um, integration with GIS and reality capture. And I'm going to talk a bit about GIS at the end of this presentation. But this is a concept where we're talking about um, asset information. So it's spatial data of assets. This is um, our route mapper tool for Highways England. And here they go around, they track the assets, they, they input information based on its condition, and they portray that back to the client along with its geospatial location as well as a point cloud reality capture data. So there's a lot built into this, but it's, it's again managing information. This example here really has nothing to do with a traditional, quote, BIM model that comes out of a Revit or a Civil 3D or any of the other competing tools. But this is about how do you bring information together and make informed decisions based on what's being portrayed. This is our, our arch control tool that, that's out of our, um, our Calgary and Edmonton offices. And this is used to track site data. So it takes, land, for land development, takes subdivision information, portrays it visually, and links it to some source information, as well as allowing us to input data, track data, and query data, and portray it to the public. So, you know, there's possibilities all across, but the first thing I say is, you know, not to lose sight of the, um, not to lose sight of the deliverable. And I think that's an important message is, as always, when I, when I go around talking, I'll say, hey, BIM can do all this wonderful stuff, but we'll still make sure we can print our drawings. And I think that's a critical thing, is that we know what our contractual deliverables are. The whole aspect of BIM as a process is to be able to, to take what we do, enhance our deliverable mechanism, make it make it viable for implementation and use, and then harness what we can for low-cost value adds or additional value adds. So this here, very conceptually, you've got a model, you slice it, you make plans and sections, you make your deliverable, and then you construct. So when I look, I look at this slide, and then the next slide I'm going to show here, Conceptually, this is the understanding that from each discipline's perspective, we're going in there, we're owning a set of data, a set of components, slicing it, producing our deliverables, and through training and support and experience, this process of making our deliverables will be enhanced and make us more efficient. That's, that's the whole point. The engineering perspective is the concept that there are varying streams of components all of us play a part in this virtual realm of pulling data together. So the work that's being done in, in the BIM industry as a whole is to ensure that whether you're doing building engineering or linear infrastructure, the tools are available to, say, um, create dot networks, analyze them accordingly, 
produce the proper deliverables, count our components, have our inputs and outputs, or to create table trays and populate them with conduits and cables based on loads that are defined in an analytical tool and have push-pull to and from. Or as I'll talk about momentarily, the structural analysis, which is exciting stuff that we can do. But don't lose sight of that deliverable. Um, the beauty of BIM is regardless of where you are, you can slice and dice anywhere across a project, producing a base for all our disciplines to see. And this is important as well because, you know, some building disciplines, mechanical and electrical specifically, rely on the basis from other disciplines in order to produce their work. So we own our content, we own our cuts, we're accountable for them, and we're sharing across a multidiscipline project. And this applies whether we're internal just all to IBI or engaging external uh, entities. Keep, keep in sight the data that you're seeing as well. So when you're modeling, understand what you're modeling and why you're modeling it. This was a graphic I made a long time ago to understand that, you know, a simple concrete wall and a footing. There's a difference. There's a difference between those components with respect to reinforcing and costing, and sometimes you'll want to portray them, but it's all concrete. So understanding that you could have, and, and don't get confused with the family term with a Revit family versus a data family, and that's what this is portraying here, is that you can have a family of materials. Is it concrete? Is it steel? Is it brick? How much of it do I have? But now tell me a little more particulars of it. So a different word you could have used there is um, category and subcategory, subcategory, just of a data stream to understand that, you know, we may be, we're assembling components and the materiality of these components will come through depending on the BIM tool that we're using. All of our components in these models are uniquely identified. And that's what I'm showing here is that any BIM tool you use, Revit, Ecosim, Civil 3D, Inroads, Geopack, doesn't matter. You place something in there, there's a backbone unique identification. So everything's already unique. There's system generated uniquenesses, and then we can add a uniqueness. So in my, in my practice, I've always used, I place a door, I get an identity, I add the door tag, which is my specific door number. Um, you can add column markings, you can, have, you can add equipment numbering. Your equipment numbering may be associated to the room with, which, within which it resides, or maybe to the flow stream. So a valve might carry on a flow stream designation based on the pipe within which the valve is placed. So there's different ways to uniquely identify. You may have a client that says, as I said, those clients that are into the asset management, they may say, hey, we care about these 15 or 20 asset types. And when you model them, I want to see this unique identification. So regardless of what we may do, we may need to add a unique tag to match something a client desires, because they're going to maybe pull that information into an asset management system like Maximo and hope to draw that info from our models. Um, quantities then just come out. And, and, I, and I say that with air quotes, and I stress that saying, it's only as good as what you put in. So if I need to know this example I use because I could show volume of concrete very easily by saying show me everything that's pegged as concrete. But do I need to show volume of wall versus volume of footing? Um, do I need to show volume of walls that are under hydrostatic pressure versus walls that are under just great pressure of ground versus walls that are exposed out of ground? That all depends on how we're quantifying, how we're estimating, what we have to turn over. It could be as simple as just push a button and show me what you got, or there could be some more complexity to it. Um, change management, for me, is extremely advanced when you have the 3D environment. So this example here, I'm saying a, a change request would come in, move these pipes. And in isolation, Moving pipes might be a very simple effort, grab them and move. But what the model forces is to say, I can't just move my singular discipline. I need to look in conjunction with all the other elements that are surrounding that pipe. So you can see here, what's surrounding it? There's a, there's a curve around the pipe. If I move the pipe, it'll affect the curve. If I move the pipe, it'll affect the grading. It may affect clearances on the valve. It may affect walking clearance coming around the, um, the tank. So, 
So these are critical points where it's not just is it interfering with actual components that surround my, my elements, but is it also interfering with reserved spaces, design intent, um, and anything else that would have a negative ramification. So it's very critical to say in the BIM world, this concept of design review with multidiscipline work is so critical and that's where projects really have to pull these models together and understand the impacts and ramifications of elements to beside each other. And I've seen some excellent examples of this in the last several years. So, you know, I think the more familiarity and the more leadership we have to pull our components together like this, the more informed our decisions will be, and I think the less the less uh, ramifications there'll be during construction. And that leads into design review. So, from a design review perspective, this is a a BIM use that I'll say is very heavily used. You know, there's different ways to review, simple ways of just you know, open your model and look. Other ways of saying, well, you know what, I've got here in this example four streams of information. So each discipline, we will assume, is design reviewing against themselves. Now we've got to pull them all together. So there's a couple different ways that I'll show here. And the best is, you know, you plan, plan the workflow on your project and we plan the workflow based on IBI best practices or based on the joint ventures within which we're working. But there's two tools, uh, Navisworks and Navigator are two, two ones that I've stewarded in, in the past decade or so. You know, Navisworks is really great. It, pull, it can pull anything. I mean absolutely anything that's a model and that has geometry, whether it's Autodesk, Revit, Bentley, SolidCAD, SolidWorks, sorry, SolidWorks, not SolidCAD, um, Archicad, you name it, can all come together into one environment. It, it loses some data for some applications, uh, but it gives you the geometry for almost anything. So pretty cool for design review. Navigator is Bentley's product, and they use a tool called an iModel. And what they do is they put a plug-in into various applications, and they focus on saying, we're going to grab geometry plus data. So it's not there for everything because they're targeting specific applications like Revit, like Archicad, Tecla, et cetera, to say we're going to target these models and pull them all together into a working environment. Both have mobile applications. You can get onto tablets and view things on site in a, in a tablet environment. Some better than others, but the gist is if you've ever played on the Xbox or PS3, you're now doing that with your BIM model. And that's really cool. You can query things, et cetera. Um, then there's live model review. So in the BIM for Architects, I showed an example with Revit. You just get in there and you just start to feel and immerse the space. Same here with the, this is um, inroads. And you can start to understand what's happening in your model, visualize it, interact with the components. Again, not all engineers will do this, so that's where teaming happens with, or collaborative teaming with your modeling um, uh, gurus to get them in the model and help you to visualize the terrain or the corridor as it stands. I like this example here. This was an old project of mine where that section is what's being represented in this, um, in this image here. And it just shows how things are coming together and put together and the intricate interaction of systems and components. And often what clients have said is obviously they look at the drawings and they just have no concept of visualizing exactly what's happening in there compared to what's in a simple image, quote, simple in air quotes, image like that. So intelligence and modeling. So Again, I wanted I structured this presentation today of, you know, be mindful of what we have to do. We always have to make our drawings, we always have to deliver. But now because we have models, we can start to think of some of the some of the other things that we can do. So I'm going to talk a bit about structural steel here for a moment because this is a powerful capability and also something that's scary to an extent. So regardless of your BIM application, when I'm placing components using uh, beams or columns, I'm being asked, what do I want to place? And that's a very critical thing. So you can, for example, I hit place beam, I'm able to select beam tables, and here I'm just showing you, I've got the Australian, um, CISC, there's um, uh, 
timber I can select, I can select UK, India, you name it. They're all, all of these are, are publicly published industry standard sections that are available for me to select. So that sounds pretty good. The information's there, it can then be queried, quantified, etc. But I always say, what if it's wrong? The first image was from Ecosim, Bentley's Ecosim, which is their Revit version. This is from Revit itself, exactly the same concept. Here I'm placing a column, I select my member, and I can place it. Again, what if it's wrong? So I think there, are, think of now the dynamic between architectural and structural. And what if I, the architect, say I want a beam and I want, I want the beam to be just 200 deep. I select the W200 section, I'm happy and I leave it alone. But then structural says, well, wait a minute, my beam has to be a 400 section, so double the depth. The ramifications on the design and the space of the ceiling, et cetera, all has to be worked out. But that communication has to occur because as modelers are modeling, they're asked, what am I supposed to put? So you can select placeholder sizes, but how do you know what's right? So think about that in your design processes, but to compound all of that information can now come out of the model and go to these various file formats. I'm going to talk a bit about some of these, but the idea there is these are industry standard, ISO standards. Data comes out from a BIM tool, and then data goes in to a modeling tool. And I can take that data now. I can view it, interact with it. This is just a mobile application, a structural viewer. I've taken a steel model onto an iPad. I can view it, query it, understand it, and see it in real context. So that's a cool thing. I can pull out of the model, and I can inform myself and others on what data is there just by touch interaction. We'll get back to analysis in a moment. What about on the plant side? So if I'm doing a piping model, I usually would start with an intelligent schematic. That schematic is going to be rich with information. So right off the bat, I have to place pipelines and valves and equipment, and I have to know a little bit about that. So when I, hit, when I go to place a valve in a schematic, it asks me, is it a plug valve, a knife valve, a gate valve, a ball valve? And I'm placing inside a pipeline, and it's already asking me about the pipeline. What's its size? What's it, its material? What's flowing through the pipe? Is it pressurized, etc.? So it's already laying a playbook, if you will, of data as we're developing these schematics. I can then query it just like it could with structural steel, list of valves, list of services, is it new, etc., what unique tags I've given them, what the sizes are. So that's pretty powerful. Link it into a database. We'll get back to what we can do with that information. But just think about, as I'm going through that, I laid the framework, and now I want to interact. How do we ensure that data is strong, that data is valid? Because what I can do now is say, great, I've got a structural analysis model, and I have components and beam sizes, column sizes that I've put into the model, and I can push and pull from my analysis model to my BIM model. This could be a Revit model, an Ecosim model, an Archicad model. It's using the same push-pull engines in all of these building-based BIM tools. What if it's wrong? And I'm going to keep asking that because, you know, I want to be optimistic and say, well, it's just going to be right. But imagine, and I've seen in the past where a modeler has been placing columns. So I place my four columns, and then I take that column, rotate it 90 degrees, and I make up my beam. What do you think a structural analysis is going to do if a column is now a beam? It's going to be fundamentally flawed and wrong. Simple, that's the only way to put it. So, you know, we work through those. We make sure our modelers are trained well. We make sure our engineers are speaking to our modelers. We make sure there is that bi-directional consistency of communication verbally in the discipline to ensure that there is that communication within these analytical tools. But in parallel, if I'm the structural engineer shepherding this environment, I then have to make sure that what I'm putting here is in alignment with the expectations of the architect on a buildings project. Maybe that it's working on a pipe network project. If I'm doing a support structure, I have to make sure that it's supporting the pipes that are interfacing with what I'm supporting. So there's a whole lot of questions that can be asked there. Bentley has a tool called an ISM 
an integrated structural model. And their approach is, is exactly the same as any of the other export tools. But I wanted to show this because they've transcended whether you're in Archicad, Revit, Ecosim, it just doesn't matter. They'll pull structural data from any source and feed it into analysis tools like STAT and RAM. And I know within IBI we do have some use of that, but within the industry, STAD and especially RAM are very heavily used, is heavy, heavily used for structural steel analysis. And that concept there of going from your Revit or your AutoCAD or your MicroStation or your Ecosim or Archicad into an analysis tool to then show me how my structure is going to deflect, maximum deflections, loading pressures, um, wind loads versus static load versus dynamic load of a gravity load, all that shown in sight based on what's in my model, and then any adjustments made on the analysis side push it back to the BIM model. So again, it's a very powerful capability that I wanted to expose to the group here. The other thing we can do is, um, from an electrical perspective, the lighting analysis is, is a very powerful tool as well. So that allows us to take our spaces based on the lighting the, the lighting fixtures that are placed in the space and the metadata associated to those fixtures allows us to analyze the light spread or the daylighting and how, and how all of that will affect the overall ambiance of the space. A lot of this can be used for sustainability calculations as well, thus strong tie there between what's happening in the architect's model the changes that are occurring with structural and mechanical, and that would impact then the light spreads and how, how the light will interact with the space and the surfaces in the lighting analysis tool. Uh, we could do mechanical analysis. And this, this uh, example here is shown by Safera, who we've done some experimenting with. But the idea there is to take our spaces and the materiality and allow us to analyze heat gains, heat loss, and the overall draw that would be required to both cool the space and heat the space, depending on the climactic nature of your geographic location. So again, it's a powerful tool. It's a cloud-based cloud service that takes the information and allows you to analyze it utilizing the interface that you see here very dependent on true and accurate information. Everything I'm showing here, I'm going to keep repeating that, true and accurate information is the only way to actually achieve any of these results that we're seeing here. Again, with Zafera, this is their new energy analysis module that they have built in as well. So based on what's required to heat and cool your space, as well as the materiality of your, of your model that's brought in, any shading factors, et cetera, that allows them to calculate your energy consumption and thus in, an, in jurisdictions where you have to prove energy consumption, energy waste loss, et cetera, it allows you to, um, allows you to have a, a, a cloud-based analytical tool that can hopefully prove or disprove certain things that you're trying to, uh, to achieve. Again, it's the data. Looks at the space, space components. So in, in a Revit example, it brings in your Revit model looks at the room definition, ensures the model is closed, meaning that there's no um, gaps in the modeling. So it, you got to make sure that the roof and ceiling is in place and in contact with the walls, which is in contact with the floor, thus creating the true 3D space, a closed space. Then it looks at any punctures in the wall, whether it's defined as glass or not, and if it's glass, the type of glass, reflectivity, and it allows it to do the overall full calculation or to its best extent. Now I talked earlier the, about the data that goes into the piping model. With a correct pipe BIM tool, so this would be your, your open plants, your auto plants, your plant 3D, stuff of that nature, they're all based on a standard ISO standard, which is ISO 15926. Don't know if anybody's heard of that, but it's the equivalent to the IFCs for BIM. This would be a plant, a, a data standard for plants. So when you make those intelligent schematics and make your pipelines and your valves, and then you generate your model, the model gives it the virtual space. 
so length of pipes, et cetera, curvatures, you can then bring that data directly into a pipe analysis tool and start to analyze deflection on the pipes based on spans between, between pipe supports, based on thrusts, uh, so velocity of what's inside the pipe and its impact on when it's going to come to uh, elbows or tees. You can look at flow rates and flow simulation based on what's moving through your pipes. And you can analyze the assemblies as a whole based on the modeled piping components as well as the modeled structural support components and see if it's working together in unison, bring an equilibrium. So uh, for me, this is some phenomenal stuff here to be able to have that straight directional communication from a plant schematic or an industrial schematic through a piping model to an analysis tool. And again, the, the metadata is so inherently critical to yielding something beneficial in a tool like this. But again, from the first session, keep in mind your deliverables. We still have to deliver the project, but if we're going to harness tools like this, these possibilities do exist inside the BIM world. From an electrical analysis perspective, there are some intriguing things that can be done. And first, from a modeling perspective. So if you can model your, your transformers and your switch gear, you can model uh, light fixtures for sure, switches and plugs, you can definitely model those. But when we get into cable trays and conduits and you know how big of a conduit should we model, and often we say 100 millimeter, 4 inches or greater, some, a lot of projects are saying, no, oh, do 50 millimeters or two inches and greater. Um, but once you do that, you can start to analyze if you're doing a full BIM-based electrical analysis with single line diagrams and point-to-point -point connections, I can now look to see how, much, how, how many wires and conduits will be required to size the cable trays and then use analytical tools to actually populate the cable trays as well, as well, or to actually populate the conduits with the wires. So there's some, some interesting things that can be done. And is, you know, the value to those could be for visualization, clash detection, for spooling quantities of conduit, quantities of wire itself, and informing the a, a DEB contractor or in a P3 arrangement um, information and bill of materials. So there's some, uh, you know, pretty cool stuff there. Uh, the critical thing to understand, and this is both for piping as well as for electrical and mechanical, you know, the importance of the single line diagram. The amount of data that is housed in those diagrams from an asset perspective is, is rich. There's a lot of stuff there, and it will influence the 3D model itself, but more importantly, any analysis and any asset management. Um, my favorite example is um, uh, in, in treatment plants, you could have level monitors, level switches, or pressure differentiators that are all attached to the lines at some point or another. We probably wouldn't model those minuscule little components, but they would definitely be represented in those schematics and pulled into an asset management system. Uh, this is um, a, a couple pictures from our OLRT as well as Viva, and this is just from a linear infrastructure perspective, just above and below grade coordination. Uh, wanted to show this because, you know, oftentimes when, when when people talk BIM, again they related either BIM for the architects or BIM for the buildings. But look at what's underneath these this site. So you know. BIM, just simple coordination of the infrastructure that's housed underneath the grade. That is huge. And on a project going down a vast corridor, the Viva corridor or linear transportation corridors, if we, got, if we get this right and avoid clashes and have a clear understanding of what's occurring, that's phenomenal. And that's where, in my opinion, BIM brings the biggest value to coordinate what you're seeing there as well as what's happening inside the buildings. So it's, it's making them all, and what's in the buildings coordinating with or interfacing with what's underneath the site. That's the whole thing. That's BIM bringing the whole together from a multidiscipline project. 
And then in the civil world, there's just a quick example of cut fill options. So if you're on a, a site with varying terrain, you, you move one, move it to the other, or you cut and remove. This allows quick calculations based on digital terrain models that have been generated using tools like Civil 3D and Rhodes Geopack, MX, etc. So the last portion here, uh, just uh, maybe uh, there's a couple slides here on GIS. So this is a geographic information system. And for me, when, when I talk about BIM and asset management and the spatial data, that's where GIS comes into play. So we, we've done a, a webinar, so these are some slides borrowed from a design technology webinar earlier in the year. Um, but I wanted to stress this because the BIM data interrelates to the GIS data. So if you look around the buildings you're all sitting in right now, and you look at any piece of, any, any component, a table, a chair, a light, the building as a whole, all of that sits somewhere within the world. And that interrelation to how it interacts with the world is how I describe GIS. GIS manages the interaction of assets and their built environment and tracks various types of data. It allows you to look, understand, query, change, turn on, turn off. If I move X, what's the ramifications on Y, Z, et cetera. So that's GIS. And just some examples of what we've done with this. Um, we've, we've created um, official plans and master plans using a GIS backbone So in for urban planning, allowing us to manage um, property types, re analyze residential needs, land needs, depending on population density that would then inform potentially how, how a, um, uh, a city or a town may need to grow or develop. And it's all about adding various data layers. So you can actually look at the interactions of what's being proposed versus what's actually existing versus other things that may be proposed. From an asset management perspective, this is um, an example of um, managing um, water, stormwater, sanitary infrastructure for Middlesex Center, the municipality of Middlesex Center. And here it was the ability to track all of the pieces of the puzzle. That's literally what it's doing here. So I can go into one environment, find where all my assets are, geospatially located, and maybe link to other data or see how it relates to the subdivisions or to other infrastructure that's flowing and interacting with it. So it's, it's a graphical interface, rich with data, rich with asset management. This one here is was a landscape architecture example, lo, lo, um, focusing on what they call the zone of theoretical visibility. And that's pretty cool. So it's, it's analyzing what's visible versus not from various points around this interface. And you know, it, it, the, the model itself was used to create view sheds and view planes to understand the varying uh, land heights and how view is um, affected by undulations in the land as well as different vantage points and perspectives. So, you know, that, again, it's different types of data. That's what GIS is. If you're wondering what tools are used for stuff like this, we, in, in IBI, we use the ArcGIS offered by Esri, and that's probably the, the widest use, even industry-wide. They're very heavily known for the GIS capabilities focusing on data mapping. Um, we used mapping for the Pan Am Games in Toronto. And you know they, they, they built all the, the venues, they mapped traffic management during the games, they were able to capture how traffic was moving and flowing and allowed them to portray that information to the games operators. And they helped to devise routes and networks and how to get people to and from the various venues. Again, data layers bringing everything together and portraying it via a medium to a consumer or a stakeholder. And this is one I just wanted, I put this up there uh, about a decade ago, I was working on the London Olympics and that was where I was first exposed to GIS. So I was brought there to help build the BIM setup and implementation 
and they kept saying, and you're going to have to talk to GIS. And when I discovered what GIS was, I was enthralled because it was essentially, you tell me what BIM data you need or what BIM data will help to achieve the GIS goals. And we built workflows to get them that information. And this GIS viewer was built for public consumption. So throughout prior to the 2012 Olympics and during, the public was able to access this via the, this government website here and interact with the spatial data, um, plan a visit. They pull this up, how, what were the roadways and the walkways, where were the bridges, how did I connect to transit, so the, the transit infrastructure that would interact with the games park, or what was secured versus opened, and how do I plan to get to the venues that I wanted to get to. So this here was fully developed by the design consortium that, of which I was a part and had a, a direct interrelation to the development of the BIM models. So for example, as the stadium or the aquatic center was being developed, once they hit certain milestones, updates were sent to the GIS team in order to update the viewer. And that would be both 2D based plans as well as I would call rudimentary 3D uh, masses so that if they wanted to have the 3D layer on, they were able to view it. So just to close, keep be mindful of your possibilities. So I've talked about a lot there, and I did a, quite a bit of focus on analysis. And I'll say there, there is never any right or wrong answer for analysis. Um, BIM is there to help and it'll take some time to build that comfort level. And I've seen that with both engineering and architectural analysis, to have that comfort level in what's being modeled in order to allow you to hold that for you know, the, the, the validity of it. I've also seen in the past, from an estimation perspective, you know, you give me your quantities, but I don't trust them yet. I still want to go and do my hand estimates and hand quantifying once I build the comfort level, then I'll trust what comes out of your models. So again, that will all take time. And you can imagine around this wheel there, I didn't even touch on fabrication in this, in this call, but that there would be, you know, if the steel models, if, for example, are rich with information and are valid and true and trustworthy, steel fabricators could then take that model directly into their fabrication software like Tacla and build the fabrication details, get it to that LOD 350 or above, turn that back over to the design and designers and the contractors, and limit the use potentially of steel shop drawings. But you need that a heavy trust in the BIM model and able to do it in, 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 in order to allow that to happen. Specifications is one I'm going to touch upon in the next BIM session. Specs are very powerful in order to both drive the model as well as to drive an output. And that's what we're going to talk about next time is how does an engineering model, like a piping model, for example, how does it get informed by the spec? And not only informed, but driven. So that if it's not in the spec, I can't even model it. And then vice versa, if I have master specs, I can analyze my model and query the data and develop project specs directly. So we'll talk a little bit about that in the next session. And I just, you know, keep in mind always the asset management. BIM is nothing more than a collection of assets. That's all it is. Geospatially coordinated, inside a virtual model, a whole host of data either being placed in the model or associated from other data streams, shop drawings, operations manuals, etc. And at the end of the day, our clients want something fruitful that can then be harnessed for something else. So thank you all. Um, this is just the, uh, a list of the curriculum. The next session will be um, three weeks from now on May 30th, Monday, May 30th. Um, I forgot to mention at the beginning, if you guys are in a room and you're an AIA member or you just want to obtain the IBIU certificate, please email the attendee list to IBIU at IBIGroup.com. And if you're an AIA member in the room, make sure your AIA number is on the attendee list. And if you're on the webinar, an AIA member, please include your 
um, your webinar, your um, AIA number on the webinar question box. And with that, are there any questions? I'm just going to pop out the question box here. There are. Excellent. So I'll just quickly go through any questions we have here. Um, okay. Do you plan a future BIM presentation that might examine some of the nuances related to interiors and the engineering disciplines? Uh, that's a good one. Um, what I might do, I'm, I'm taking notes on questions like that. So the example there was the AV, the electrical, HVAC, IT, etc. Um, the one on asset management, I, ha I was going to have a focus on an interiors example that we're, we're playing with, but um, that not, I didn't specifically have something, but I'll definitely look to include something in, in some of the subsequent lectures. So thank you for that. Um, okay, that's really everything else is just the numbers. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Well, if that's all, I just want to thank everybody. And if anything comes up, do feel free to email me, um, and we'll get you everything, any answers we can get you. Okay, thank you, everybody.